we basically study enlightenment, non-duality, persistent mystical experience, and so on. Our academic term for that is most typically these days persistent or ongoing forms of non-symbolic experience. But uh, we tend to use fundamental well-being in the public sphere. And this is a talk that's a little more tilted towards the public, even though this is an academic society. It's going to be very academic -y as a talk. But I know there's a lot of public folks here. And so I'm going to go ahead and use the term fundamental well-being for the most part throughout it. Note that it does not relate just to spiritual people or religious people, atheists and agnostics and so on, also experience these same things. Let me talk about what we've learned. So first, let's cover just very briefly, even though I know a lot of you already know this, what persistent non-symbolic experience or fundamental well-being is. Well, it's a persistent shift that happens in your nervous system, basically away from an old wired in survival system that keeps you on guard and on edge in every moment, even if you don't really perceive that you are. It's the water that you're living in, and most people can't even perceive it. They don't realize how activated their nervous systems really are compared to what the alternative can be. And so you see here, we say it's a shift, really, to a deeper fundamental sense of okayness or contentment. There's a sense that you don't need to explore or you know, add anything to yourself. It's okay to explore, but you, don't, you, you feel whole essentially. You don't need to add anything to yourself. There is reduced or even eliminated mental chatter. And by that mental chatter, it's really the self-reflexive stuff. So it's, you know, geez, should I have worn a white shirt today? Or maybe I should have worn a sport coat? Or oh, I wonder what, is the lighting okay in here? Or, you know, all those sort of neurotic type of thoughts, they tend to get significantly reduced or go away altogether. And along that, along with that, their ability to impact your uh, mood uh, there's an increased or total focus on the present moment, an increased sense of connectedness and possibility, and what I would call life flow instead of task flow. You know, in the psychology space, there's a lot made about flow, where you're in the moment and you're flowing, and they're like the, you know, the your individualized sort of narrative nagging sense of self is out of the way, and you're just like purely able to, you know, cycle for the championship or whatever. Um, well, that's nice, but that is always task and sort of goal oriented. And so this is sort of a form of that that relates more to life flow. Well, deeper patterns emerged, and I want to talk about these in the context just so that they'll all be in this presentation. Um, so what we wound up discovering were sort of different ways that fundamental well-being showed up for people. And we divided those up in what we called locations along a continuum of related experiences. Now, I'm not gonna go too terribly in depth because as these appear on your screen, uh, you can easily read them, but I do wanna touch on sort of some of the highlights of each one of these locations. And so in location one, which is where most people transition, most people will transition to location one, fewer to location two, fewer to location three, and so on from sort of ordinary egoic or what we like to call narrative self type of consciousness. There is that fundamental sense of okayness, but it's kind of in the background, basically. Um, and in fact, it can be occluded by conditioning, psychological conditioning and psychological triggers and stuff coming up. You know, people actually not thinking that they're even in fundamental well-being. They don't realize, geez, if I just stop in this moment and I really look down deep, there is this lasting sense of peace that is always there regardless of what's happening at a higher level. So all of the other things that I said on the previous slide uh, basically go for this one. In location two, the second sort of type of this experience or category of this experience, one of the things that's happening is a shift in perception. This is the real hallmark of location two. Uh, so you may have heard things like unity consciousness and stuff like that. Well, that shows up in a lot of different places in fundamental well-being, but the first place it shows up is in location two. So there are various forms of it. Um, that's very confusing to people who go out and read a bunch of spiritual literature or watch a bunch of YouTube videos from spiritual teachers or stuff like that. Um, just keep in mind that there's a lot of different types of sort of a unified sense of perception. Um, it really does feel like there's just one thing. And that first place that you experience that, if you're on the continuum somewhere, is in location two. 
everything else continues to go down. Your self-referential thoughts continue to go down, your mood and your positive emotions and stuff sort of continue to increase. Uh, everything sort of has this trend. There's a pulling more forward of that background sense of peace to sort of infuse more of your life. Location three is basically the end point of the Abrahamic traditions. And so the Sufis and their love and the Christian mystics and their love and their divine love and their merging and they're getting closer and closer to merging with the divine and all of that. That's basically location three. Of course, there are, are also Eastern religions that deal with it, but they, these are sitting at the center, basically, of the mystical traditions on the Abrahamic Western side of the fence. And so it's basically a single emotion that remains at this point that's kind of a combination of love and joy and compassion. And there can be some other things mixed in there that are sort of programmed in culturally or individually from the environment or whatever. But those are generally always there. One of them is usually more forward at any given time, one of the facets of that emotion. Uh, there's two forms of this. You can have a version of it that feels very divine, or you can have a version of it that feels panpsychic. Uh, you've heard the term panpsychic a few times in this conference. It just basically means a feeling that like everything is conscious, if you will, or everything is uh, in some way kind of made of consciousness, or you sort of have this conscious being. Um, and it's very close to God, but it's, with, but it's not described with the same divine type of aspect. Uh, and then location four, uh, which is no sense of agency, no sense of emotion. Um, you know, it's a very, very different place from what came before it. And yet in many ways, it just continues the progression that you see starting at location one. So thoughts by this point, those self-referential thoughts are just dead silent. Um, the last bit of emotion, which was that single positive emotion basically goes away. Um, your sense that you can do anything, make any choices or anything like that typically goes away. Uh, there's a synchronistic unfolding that is basically felt at this point. Um, so you get the idea. This is a very, very intense form of non-duality that, that occurs starting in location four. In location three, it's actually a dual location like location one is. And the way to think about that is actually very simple. If you were trying to, you know, if the sense was that you were going to be in more union with God or the divine or whatever, well, that posits that there's a divine out there and you're here and you're sort of, you know, increasingly getting in union with it. And so there's a subtle sense of, of that dual sort of nature of experience in it. A lot of people actually miss that because it's a very powerful experience. Okay, so there's the full continuum. We'll see this in, a, in another way a little bit later. It's a little bit more abbreviated, so I can put more on the slide. Uh, I'm just trying to give you enough information here so that you get a sense of what these different types of it actually are. Now, location five or later, we're not going to really cover much in this talk. Uh, there's a fork in the road. There's two sort of paths after that. One continues in the direction of location four with that same sort of no emotion and so on type of direction. Another one has a return to some non-personal types of emotion. And typically you see that more in the West, you see the location four uh, type of experience more in the East. Um, that one's what we like to call the path of freedom. And the other one that has a little bit of return to emotion and whatnot, uh, we like to call the path of humanity. So when you hear those terms later, just keep in mind that that's what they refer to. There's basically an increasing flatness of perception that starts at location four and just continues on through about location nine or so. There are many, many more locations than that. It's very, very rare for anyone to actually uh, experience them. And the transitions at the later stages can be very dramatic. Even the transition to location four can cite, like engender a whole new dark night of the soul, which is kind of crazy if you think about the fact that in the background, there's supposed to be just this deep, persistent form of peace. How do you get the turmoil of a dark night of the soul type of thing happening there. And yet that is exactly uh, what can happen. It doesn't always happen. It's not a normal thing to have happen, but it can happen. People do report it happening. And these transitions between these later locations can actually even be dangerous. They seem to be getting at stuff that is so low level in the brain that they can cause sensory glitches. They, you know, People can not be able to move parts of their body or even be fully paralyzed for periods of time, but usually very short periods of time. But nonetheless, it's nothing to really be trifled with. Uh, finally, at location nine, you sort of have the sense of it's just the universe 
looking at your eyes. I would say even beyond that, location eight, you really have that. By location nine is sort of your whole body is just sort of this universe uh, sort of expression. Um, okay, so key features, just keep these in mind. Location one, you've got that fundamental okayness that comes in. Location two, you've got the fundamental okayness with the first glimpses of non-duality. Location three, you've got that single positive emotion, that divine or panpsychist uh, merging with. Location four, no motion, no agency. The key word here is really freedom, the sense of the divine or panpsychist uh, experience that you're having if you're coming here from location three. Uh, that's basically gone. Uh, and you feel kind of like an alien, frankly, at location four. It's like location three is sort of the pinnacle of human experience, and location four is really just something very different entirely. And then from five on, it depends on the path. So you can see a lot more about that at you know, published papers that we've done within the academy or this book. I want to get to what's new, and that is a movement basically from the continuum that we've talked about for many years. And I talked about the continuum for many years because this was the thing that virtually nobody knew about. Um, and the part that we're going to talk about today as we transform the continuum into a matrix is the part that virtually every spiritual teacher is talking about, every spiritual book is written about, Every YouTube video that you'll ever see from a spiritual or religious teacher that talks about anything mystical or whatever is about. Uh, and so this territory is actually really well known. But what people have missed is the locations that help to that color it, help to contextualize it in different ways. And thus, when you watch the stuff out there, it can all seem very, very confusing. Whereas if you actually have this framework, you'll be able to spot very precisely where everyone is. So there are four layers of depth that we add to the continuum to get to the matrix. And we're just gonna call them layer one, layer two, layer three, and layer four. So when I say layer one, it's just the first layer of depth. Uh, the, it goes deeper, the higher the number. So just like you're further in fundamental well-being from a location basis, uh, the higher the number of location, you're deeper into a given location, the higher the number of layer that you're in. Now, another way to think about this is that these are actually sort of discrete collections of experience. If we take the axes away, they kind of look like this, where you have location one, layer one experience that you could be in, or location two, layer two experience, or location two, layer three experience, or whatever, right? So you get the idea. Now, these layers, what we think is actually happening here is that they're really a shift of perception to older and older parts of the nervous system. And you can see some glimpses of that and some wonderful, there's so much wonderful neuroscience work out there these days. I think probably the most accessible uh, to match up to these layers is Antonio Damasio's work. And so you can Google him, uh, read more or less any of his books, except maybe his latest one, um, and, or just read some articles by him or whatever. And you'll hear sort of the neuroscience equivalent of these various layers. And if you're in these or you've experienced them, they'll be really clear what you're reading uh, in Antonio's work. One thing to keep in mind is that they are all always active in your brain. They're all always active in your experience or in your nervous system. And so it, the one that you're dominantly perceiving is typically occluding your perception of the other ones, but that doesn't mean that the other ones aren't there and they aren't operating. They are, which is why you get spiritual teachers saying things like, oh, it's always there, you just have to uncover it, you know, and it can never go away. Well, when you start talking about the depth of fundamental well-being, that's actually the case. When you're talking about the locations, those really are significant rewirings that occur in the brain. There are, you know, location two is not always there, right? Uh, but layer two is always there, is a good way of thinking about this. And most people's conscious perception in terms of uh, people that aren't in fundamental well-being, and even many that are in fundamental well-being, is basically centered at layer one. Okay, so let's look at these real quick. Again, I'm going to go through them pretty quickly here, keeping an eye on time. So layer one properties. This is basically the fundamental well-being well version of being in your mind. And that's another reason why a lot of people don't recognize their transition to fundamental well-being. We think there are a lot more people in fundamental well-being than realize it. But most people transition to location one, layer one, right? And so you've got your piece really in the background and you've got 
you know, you're sort of in, still in the mind, basically. Um, and so it's very difficult in some cases for people to discern that a very significant change has happened in their nervous system. They're not told, hey, well, okay, fine. So you're experiencing a little turbulence around emotion or whatever. We'll stop for a minute and look down deep. And it, what is down deeper in your system? Is it turbulence or is it that everything seems okay? Right? Just nobody ever does that. They don't even do that in the spiritual and religious communities. And so consequently, people basically miss a lot about where they're at. Well, I'm just going to go through these. Uh, I'll put them all on the screen here for you. And you can see that basically this is what the mind is like normally. So this is there's a fundamental well-being version of this that isn't as nearly as bad. In fact, it's awesome. Uh, especially as you go through and decondition and fundamental well-being really takes hold over the years and stuff like that. You know, a lot of these things lessen, they all get a lot better and whatnot, but it's still fundamentally the tendencies of the mind that someone that isn't in fundamental well-being is used to, right? What I want to do here is read some of the descriptions to you, actual participant um, some actual participant stuff here um, so that you can actually see, and you can read these as well while they're on the screen, so you can get a feel for the, how different this is between the locations, right? It's the same general thing that's happening layer-wise in terms of depth, but how it expresses across the locations is very different. We probably won't have time to do this with every layer, um, but we can do it uh, with this one. So let's take a look at location one. So what is it what does the person say? This is just a person uh, from our data that's sort of been pulled as an example. Normal functioning in location one, layer one, normal functioning and activity of the mind, but reasonably calm and present most of the time. Curious and open rather than fearful, allowing uh, for greater neutrality and observation of what is. It can be more reasonable and balanced in relating to others since it isn't heavily invested in protecting the narrative sense of self. Social functioning is fine, memory is fine, planning is fine. Okay, now compare that to location two. Normal enhanced functioning of the mind, mind feels clearer, sharper, and is capable of, of great focus and efficiency. There is no distinct sense of an I that is thinking. It is more like an impersonal process that one can engage with. With less identification with thoughts, there's a diminished need to be right, which allows for greater objectivity and receptivity. The mind can still actively engage with its own workings. Memories are present, are prevalent, are less prevalent, but not inaccessible. Planning and its implementation seems perfectly fine. All right. Pretty big difference between location one and location two, just at this one layer of depth. Location three, if you're in location three, layer one, what's it like? Mind is much more quiet. It can be biased by love and joy. So uh, and so it can be unwise at times. Though its functions are essentially intact, one is just less inclined to use them. The ever-present experience of love, beauty, devotion, all create a sense of tirelessness and inspiration. The compassion, unity, and love make connection with others natural and enjoyable. Uh, so social functioning is fine. Again, location four, the next uh, type of experience. It functions autonomously. There is no way to influence it, no self-referential thoughts, and zero interest in meaning or purpose. Very little thought of past or future. Takes effort to go there when it's necessary. Memory is definitely worse at this point. Relying on lists and notes seems unavoidable. Planning and taking action mostly rely on external stimuli to initiate them as there is no internal drive or energy to do so. Thought can solve problems, analyze, reason, interpret, deal with practical things when called for. The social side is an ideal, stemming largely from disinterest and lack of affinity with others. The mind is very quiet and thoughts are often very brief or half-formed. It's not compelling. No thought feels true or important. The gravity of silence tends to preclude thinking. And in fact, one could even, you know, if you look at this, it's even a sense that you can't think. You can watch the thinking occur, but you really are not an active participant in the thinking process like you were at the previous locations. And then finally, location five, 
It functions autonomously. Again, there's no way to influence it. The mind is mostly silent, but its practical and intellectual functions are intact for the most part. The social side is less optimal. It's hard to follow what people are saying when they aren't direct or to the point or when they tell long stories. It's hard to see their perspective or to know what they want or feel if they don't state it directly. There are uh, things that were once thought uh, seem to happen of themselves as if thinking is happening, but without taking any form, no image, no sound, no movement. Of course, uh, we all think in our minds in different ways. Some people think very visually, some people think with words, some, pe some people think with sound. Uh, there's great work that's been done on that, especially out of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. It is like thought is replaced by knowingness, which is silent and self-evident, innate to the unfolding itself. In watching it, the past days, again, this person was, um, you know, asked to create these descriptions, right? It looks almost like there is thought, but no awareness of it because the body will react as if there was a thought, like a sudden change in direction, get up and say something, which would normally be intentional and the consequence of a thought, but now it feels intrinsic to the unfolding. The subjective experience is that nothing causes anything. Though if reasoning from the perspective of brain processes, one could say that perhaps thought is occurring outside of conscious awareness, right? Same layer of depth, right? And yet this is how they're experienced across these different types of fundamental well-being. Okay, so layer two. Layer two properties. The piece moves more to the foreground. Um, you know, it's mentally quieter. There's a new level of stillness and silence. And one thing that you're going to get as you move across these different layers is that stillness or silence, some people prefer the word stillness, some people prefer the word silence. I just put them both there. They basically refer to the same thing internally. Um, they're really the thing that sort of pulls you through these layers. So they're the thing that is consistent from layer to layer, right? So it's less, you might feel, it might feel when you first transition to layer one, maybe you first transition in location two, layer one, you can transition to anywhere in the first location, first four locations, uh, from normal consciousness. So you might just pop right into location two, layer one. Maybe it feels like, Oh my God, you know, all of my thoughts went away. My mind is so still, whatever else, compared to the buzzing noise that was before and your normal egoic narrative uh, sense of self, right? But then when you move to layer two, you're like, whoa, there was still a lot of noise there. Wow, everything is still, you know, it's a lot more silent, a lot more still. Wow, this is amazing. The same thing when you go to three, layer three, layer four. Um, so, you know, there's always this deepening sense of stillness and silence. It's a great sort of way uh, a great sort of thing to focus on to pull you to greater depths. More present, everything seems to have more space around it, even conditioning. So we'll see space is a very big deal. So even something like less personal drama uh, occurring and it's seen through more effectively because things just seem like they have more space around them. Uh, what's ironic about that is that when you're less reactive, other people might be more reactive to you because they're trying, you know, they've learned this is a button I push to get a reaction out of them. And when you're not giving them the reaction, uh, they might increase their drama, essentially. Um, less reactive, of course. Layer two is a great place to hide out. People basically will go to layer two, they're kind of really root into layer two, and they'll just sort of hide out. Uh, from the world, from the messiness that's at layer one, uh, which is still very mind oriented and whatnot. And so that's something to keep in mind involving this. So more layer two properties, taking a step back from this, it's really just feels like everything is just here, right? So you just your perception of, you know, being alive, it just feels like everything is just here and everything is just kind of a rising on its own. And there's something miraculous about that. You heard Deepak alluding to this um, in the previous talk. You know, he was taught, he was some of his examples very much related to layer two, and you can spot them right away once you've got the taxonomy. So the way to think about layer two's primary properties are things like spaciousness and emptiness. There's a sense of spaciousness and there's a sense of emptiness in that spaciousness, partially because 
the mind content, that buzzing is, you know, been pulled away from even more and it isn't filling what's always there. It feels like this contain the spaciousness, this emptiness, it just contains everything. And as you go deeper into this layer, it feels like it is everything. One thing about these layers is that we're going through them from a very high level today, uh, but there's, you know, there's being in the lower part of the layer, the middle part of the layer, and the upper part of the layer. And the experiences are slightly different there as you deepen into a layer itself. So the example, for instance, that I used in the, in the chart for layer one, those were, that was someone who was really quite deepened in to layer one across those locations. If we had somebody who was more shallow, would have been different, slightly different, but still in the same direction, sort of representations. So spaciousness and emptiness, that really feels like it sort of contains everything, is everything, is just here, it's all arising on its own, and it gives you sort of that very miraculous kind of feeling. These are really the key things of layer two. Um, so everything seems to be arising from and within it. And in a sense, everything is kind of the stuff of layer two. So as you shift more deeply and exclusively in this level, one of the things that happens is that you leave kind of the last, you leave a chunk of you, of a sense of you, of a sense of I behind. This can even happen a little bit uh, at location one, it especially happens beyond location one. Uh, when you're in layer two. And that can actually bring some more issues with motivation and whatnot, because what's happened sometimes for people is if they, let's say they transition to location one, layer one. Well, that's still more or less the mind. They don't really realize it, but there's still a pretty good amounts of sense of self still there. Even in location two, there can still be a lot of sense of self there in the mind um, in that sort of, you know, layer one, uh, even in location three, frankly, uh, and if you're in it for a while, you kind of can solidify an identity there around that. And then when you shift to the next layer, to layer two, that fades out. Sometimes it falls away dramatically, depending on how powerful the shift is. Otherwise, it just sort of fades out. And you could have built up like a new way of operating in the world from that, a new level of motivation that came from a different angle, stuff like that. And then you make the shift and you're like, oh, crap, you know, where'd my motivation go again, right? Uh, so that type of thing. Um, one thing about layer two, especially location two, is that you really feel like you've made it in fundamental well-being. Like the books are making, a lot of the books are making sense. A lot of the videos from the spiritual teachers are making sense. Like you can recognize yourself in a lot of what they're saying. You know, if you were in this and you were watching Deepak's presentation before mine, you would have been like, yeah, I totally experienced that. Right. Um, and so. The interesting thing is this is in some ways the first place on the matrix where people really sort of feel a sense of accomplishment. Um, it seems like the things you've heard described, you know, from spiritual teachers, people can assume it's the end of the road. And because of that, actually, lots of people never go any further. They just are like, finally, I've made it. Now I'm just going to root in here, right, and do everything that I can to prevent, you know, moving off of the spot. Um, and it's, it's very interesting. Uh, it's also, frankly, kind of hard to get beyond, even if you're not doing that. This emptiness can also bring a sense of loneliness, uh, which is interesting. And so especially at um, location two and later, you know, if you're in location two and you're in that non-dual place where there's it just sort of feels like there's one thing and it's spaciousness and it's emptiness, you know, it's not hard to see how you can get a sense of loneliness around that. That can also happen uh, later on at location four and later. Um, a little bit less so as you go later, uh, just because it becomes almost impossible to be in layer two as you're going later in locations, as we'll see. Okay, so let's look at what this might look like going from layer one to layer two. So you're basically going from being embedded in thoughts and emotions uh, to kind of a meta-awareness of thoughts and emotions. You're getting distance from your thoughts and emotions. You know, you're basically starting to get the sense that you're not your thoughts and emotions, although people think that at multiple uh, places on the matrix. Uh, and that sort of changes to a sense or awareness of spaciousness and or emptiness, in addition to the more concrete feeling uh, of what's being uh, perceived. Uh, so essentially, you know, you, it's not that you don't still have the ability to see, oh, that's a camera 
I'm looking at, you know, these are lights, there's a microphone here, look, there's a laptop and a tablet and whatever else, right? Uh, a glass with a little bit of water left in from a long day's conference and uh, whatnot, right? Um, you definitely still see that. And that is, you know, concrete, but it's also within sort of the wider context of the spaciousness. So it's just really the spaciousness is just very obvious uh, and the emptiness and so on. And so you go from there, from sensing it, from just basically sensing, oh, there, there feels like there's something just a little bit out of reach, you know, but it feels like it might be in that direction to a direct experience of it as you're starting to deepen in uh, to layer two. And then finally to, to an association with it, I am the spacious emptiness. That is who this and what this being is. My existence is that, right? And so you can see how it's sort of, you know, this deepening process basically unfolds in a layer. Uh, and then once you're really maxing out layer two, you can start to sense, wait a minute, there's something even deeper here that seems to be infused along with this spaciousness and emptiness. And then you're sort of on to uh, the second one. Okay, so um, again, I'm not gonna read these. Um, I'm gonna uh, give you a way to sort of contact me at the end of this presentation um, so that you can um, get some of these, these types of descriptions so that you can read you know, the differences across the locations and across the layers and such. You know, we've only got an hour today, so there isn't that much time. Maybe if we have some time at the end, I can go back and we can read and talk about these, but I wanted them to at least be on the video so that you could at least read them. Um, you can pause the video, you know, and read them. Because of course, this will be made into a video and put up after the conference. Okay, so let's look at layer three. And the best way to look at layer three is to compare it and contrast it with layer two's properties. So layer three's hallmark is really fullness versus the emptiness that exists at layer two. And that fullness is basically permeating and infusing the experience of, you know, being alive uh, versus, the, versus being like a container for what's arising and the stuff that's arising um, and whatnot. So it's, it's, not the, it's not that emptiness and that spacious container anymore. Now there's this fullness that is increasingly permeating and infusing things. Uh, it's often you know, felt like a pervasive field as being complete in itself. Uh, it's even more still, remember each one of these is gonna be even more still or silent than the previous layer. And that aloneness thing is gone. So that aloneness thing that happens from the emptiness feeling of layer two, that's not really relevant in layer three because layer three has fullness associated with it. And so there's, uh, no aloneness, so to speak. <laughs> Another type of presence or being that seems even more deeper or original or authentic is found here. So one of the things that happens at layer two that we didn't really have time to go into um, is that there is a sense of, of presence there, uh, if you will. And there's like another type of presence or what might be thought of as a beingness, a uh, type of beingness that sort of comes in that's very distinctly different at layer three than at layer two. And, and each time these things happen, right, they seem more true or more real or more authentic than the version that was just experienced. Uh, so this fullness that permeates everything, it really feels untouched and untouchable. Um, and it can feel alive, kind of. There's an aliveness to it. I don't mean that in the sense of life itself necessarily. But this it's just can feel very energized. You know, this fullness can feel very energized. Um, and so people will sometimes call that an aliveness. Eckhart Tolle, for instance, loves the term aliveness. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty certain that this is what he is trying to get people uh, to focus on. Right. And so the, you know, if you think about it, if you think about the way he talks about that, he's like, if you can just feel the aliveness, you know, that will, that's all you need. Well, yeah, if you can just feel the aliveness, it'll, you know, pull you to these deeper layers. Remember, spiritual teachers are talking about layers. They're not talking about locations. 
Um, and so aliveness is like a really big deal if you've made it to layer three. And if you're trying to convey what someone should be feeling, you know, it makes sense that someone would pick something like that. Now, the other thing is this is this layer three, if you think about it from a nervous system standpoint, it's kind of really what's actually perceiving layer two. It, it's, you know, layer two is made out of the stuff of layer three for all intents and purposes. And it does feel like that uh, as you're experiencing it. Okay, let's look at some context. So layer three is relatively rare for the general public, uh, people who are in fundamental well-being to actually experience. It's widely regarded as an endpoint among those who know about it, as finally realizing the ultimate truth you know, of who you are uh, with prior shifts, if they experienced them with someone who didn't just land right in like location two or something in layer three, um, you know, but they had some prior shifts through some locations or light layers or whatever, um, you know, what they're, what they're going to basically do is um, they're going to look at those and they're going to think to themselves, well, those are really not as real as this. So they're kind of false. They're still false identities. Now you get these war zones that occur in the spiritual and religious communities where they're like, you know, well, my fundamental well-being is more real and true than yours, right? Because it does feel like that. Um, all right. So there's a lot of proto I or I parts within layer three that were cornerstones to the formation of the self, especially from location two on. And one of the things that that provides is a vast landscape internally of sort of fundamental well being development. You know, you have people who have built massive systems around you know, the, this little part of the eye and that little part of the eye and this little thing and that little thing or whatever, all within the awareness layer. They don't necessarily realize that it's all within the awareness layer, but it's all within the awareness layer that they're working. And they can really have a spiritual system or a religious system or something that just takes forever uh, to make it through, if you can ever make it through. And in fact, almost all of those teachers, all of the ones that I can think of are still adding to their discoveries, right? They're like, oh, now there's another class or another teaching or another whatever about this other part uh, that I've uncovered and how to get rid of it and, you know, sort of whatever else, right? It is a massive landscape in layer three. You can spend forever uh, messing around with that stuff if you want, which is a little bit problematic if you're trying to go deeper uh, because those are all distractions, many of which you don't really have to worry much about. Let's look at some issues and tendencies. So layer three can increase things like the motivation problem of fundamental well-being even more. Uh, again, you know, it's so far from the things and the neuroses and the uh, patterns in the psyche that promote motivation that uh, it, it's, it's an issue. Um, you're generally even less concerned about being functional in the world at layer three. Um, because, you know, there's this sense of truth and that's really what you're pursuing. And it's really far from the mind and, you know, the layer one stuff typically and whatever else people that really go into layer three and just really, really go into layer three. Um, they definitely get disconnected, distant, you know, non-reactive in terms of normal culture and relationships and such. Um, it can make level one even more difficult and distant to access for these reasons. But one interesting thing is that we'll see later that it's often paired with, uh, with layer one. Sorry, that should say layer one, not level one. Uh, a strong pull of gravity uh, has, you know, basically it's like it's got its own gravitational pull. Like once you experience and your perception is shifted into layer three, it just like wants to be this black hole that just basically sucks you in, which is why you care a lot less about the fact that you're not motivated or that you know, you're pissing people off or uh, whatever else. Okay, some other things. Again, field-like presence really does feel like a field. Um, so when people talk about consciousness as a field or whatever, it's a real phenomenological experience. And that is definitely true of layer three. It can be true at layer two. You can kind of see it that way in layer two, but man, once you experience it in layer three, it's night and day. Um, you can affect others when you drop into it. Um, this is a weird phenomenon, but basically if you drop deeply into layer three, you can more or less like get people to stop thinking and have all kinds of effects. Now I'm, that doesn't have to be a woo woo thing. You know, there's all sorts of brainwave uh, discoveries that are being made about people affecting each other's brainwaves and whatnot, but man, it's a thing for sure. And layer three, 
deeper in layer three, um, it can kind of feel like the last center that you have goes away, especially again, more from location two on. Some of these properties are not as accessible in a location one version of layer three. The other thing is it can feel really like reality is like this thick fluid like substance that you can like just sort of pushing through um, like viscerally like a thick substance in some sense. Um, and so people get more or less of that. Uh, some people don't get that at all, but it's a very interesting uh, report that you get at layer three. Okay, so from layer one to layer three, if we go through, uh, let's see what's new, where we left off. We left off with a sense of an even deeper stillness infused within the spacious uh, emptiness, right? And so the one, two, three, four, five, sixth bullet point. And so starting with the bigger text, this is into moving into layer three from that. There becomes a direct experience of that deeper stillness pervading and coexisting with the spaciousness and emptiness. And that stillness is then next sort of felt as a fullness, a sensing of fullness coexisting with the emptiness. And finally, to association with the fullness. Again, it's the, you know, oh, that's what I am. Turns out, oh, okay, I wasn't that stuff at layer two. I wasn't the emptiness or the spaciousness. I am the fullness. That's what my true nature is, right? And so you have shifts like that going on. And then, of course, a deepening into that fullness, a deepening into that stillness. Towards the end, you get that center uh, falling out. Okay, again, um, you can pause the video if you're watching this on a video and read some of these. Uh, if we have time, we'll go back and get to them. Okay, so for the fourth layer, one thing that I want you to keep in mind is that Everything I'm about to say is a literal description, even though it's going to sound like a bunch of woo-woo, mystical type stuff. But it is not. There is nothing mystical that's about to be said. These are concrete descriptions of the experience of the world, basically, of life, of whatever you want to call it. Um, of concrete you know, descriptions of really just living and experiencing moment to moment. And you have to keep in mind that you will only resonate with these, you will only really understand them if you have actually experienced it. That's a lot of what our work is in the matrix, is trying to get these layers described in ways where if you've experienced them, you're like, aha, yes, I know that feeling. I know that I'm, I've been there or I am there or whatever else, right? And unfortunately, what that means is that if you're not there, for everybody else, they're going to try to sort of, you know, get into it, right? They're going to try to be like, okay, spacious and emptiness. Yes, yes, spacious and emptiness. Yes, okay, I can feel that spacious, and, right? But that, it's just not going to work out. Um, you can't, you can't sort of imagine your way or project your way or whatever there. So these are in this section, just like in every section, designed to help the people that are experiencing it. Uh, and you can you can get the so categories of description to help you sort of figure out, oh, this spiritual teacher is here and they're talking from this place. This spiritual teacher is there. They're talking from this other place. That can also be very helpful. So it's not just a confusing mess of teachings out there for you anymore. Uh, but keep in mind, these are real, literal descriptions. Okay, so uh, the life level is unlike anything that comes before it. It's almost like the difference between location three and location four, massive difference there, right? When you're like experiencing the divine, uh, if you get that version of location three, and then the next one, there's no divine, right? I mean, that is like, a that is a serious, you know, dark night potential moment, right? Uh, it's this same thing from layer three to layer four. It's a big chasm. Um, so it's another massive shift. Although it doesn't seem like the fullness at layer three can ever go away, Layer three seems more real than anything else. It's the end point of just about every tradition. Um, and, you know, it's, not, it's just one of those things that it's just like, it's just so real. You just can't imagine it could ever go. But it does, like that, in most cases. In most cases, it's an immediate. Sometimes it's a fading out. But generally, it's just like, it's just, it feels like it just collapses. And then you have this new layer four type experience. Okay, so... The primary change is a loss of all separation. 
And you have to be very careful with this. So you'll hear people, you'll hear teachers and books and stuff say things like I am, or I am that, or this is, or that is, or all of those things are not layer four. Anybody who's talking like that is not talking from the experience of layer four. That's all pre-layer four, right? Um, that all implies a separation. So what is it that does describe this? Mostly it's the word this. And to a great extent, that's kind of all you can say about it. Um, if you want to try to objectify it for language to describe to someone, you could say itself. Um, sometimes when people are describing it in language, they'll say that instead of this because they've learned that people's brains that aren't in it can understand, I don't know, they just kind of take it in better if they use the word that. Um, but, you know, if you're being true, it's basically this or just existence. Uh, and that's it. So let's look at some properties here. There is only this, basically, or that, or, you know, sort of whatever. Literally nothing else exists. It is only pure existence. But again, that is not metaphysical or mystical or whatever in any way. That is concrete and in many ways more ordinary than you've probably ever experienced in your entire life. It knows itself and is self-revealing beyond distinctions, understanding, and descriptions. Think of it as the difference between revelation and illumination versus self-experience, right? If something is just revealed in a moment, right, that's very different than the term self-experiencing. You just feel the difference between those two. Um, and so the revelation and illumination one is a layer four one. It's objectless. Uh, objects of awareness have no separate existence. There is only this. It's flat. There's a flatness. Uh, everything is presented as this or simply existence. Uh, so again, there's a dimensional flatness, sometimes referred to as things like the flatness absolute or something like that. Um, it's beyond description because language uses comparative distinctions. And this doesn't have anything to be distinguished against. Um, and remember, this is felt in varying ways, uh, depending upon the location. Uh, so for instance, in layer three, you hear things like, you'll hear people say things like, it's the clear light of awareness or the ground of all being. Uh, and in earlier iterations of this, we would call the layers, layer one mind, layer two consciousness, layer three awareness, and then layer four this. Um, all of these types of distinctions go. And incidentally, we don't use those labels anymore because people just get confused by them. They bring their own meaning to consciousness. They bring their own meaning to awareness. It's just, we were meaning it from more of a neuroscience type of standpoint. So, so forget about those labels and just think about the layers. But when you hear things like clear night of awareness, the ground of all being, that's often a layer three type of description. And they go, there is not being, nor is there not being, right? It is beyond an experience of being or beingness, right? As hard as that is to understand if you haven't experienced it, it's really a sense of, you know, that collapse is really a sense of dying to this. But again, this is just as ordinary as you could possibly imagine. So it's beyond all opposites. It does, it's not subject or object. It's not self or other. It's not foremost or form, inside or outside, and so on. These things are basically meaningless. Descriptions like this have absolutely no relevance from the experience of layer four. Uh, so it feels beyond states and experiences, of course, as you would expect. Um, eternal, limitless are often words that sometimes try to get at it, possibly because there's no frame of reference uh, for these, you know, if you think about it, you know, if you're in such a primitive part of your nervous system, right, it can, maybe it's like a cell. I mean, does a cell know its days are numbered? You know, is it like, you know, have some sort of capability to reflect or whatever else? Again, we think we're moving back to simpler and simpler and simpler sort of primitive and older parts of the nervous system as we move through these layers. And in some sense, you're sort of taking your perception and you're taking it from here to here to here to here to here. And you're you're really sort of whittling it down to this little tiny slice. It doesn't mean that all this other stuff isn't out here, though, as we're talking about. I mean, again, all the layers are always operating in your system, unless you've had you know, brain damage. 
Okay. So specific to how this shows up in location four later, there is an absolute sense that this cannot be attained or lost. That doesn't, it doesn't have that same sense in earlier locations because it's very hard or not. I mean, it's nearly impossible to persistently root yourself in to just layer four before location four. And so, you know, of course it can be lost because people are going in and out of it all the time, right? Uh, but it doesn't feel like that once you've deepened into layer to location four uh, or later. Uh, it feels like there's no becoming it or no entering it, as confusing as that may sound if you haven't experienced it. Like this, there's, there's literally nothing to be gained by this. You've heard some teachers talking that have, you know, sort of gone to these farthest extremes and they say, you know, there is nothing, there's nothing in this for you. There is nothing to be gained by going this far. They are completely serious. Nothing is gained, basically. Only more illusion is lost. But in the losing of more illusion, in the losing of that illusion, nothing is gained, which is a bit of a paradox, probably, from where you're coming from right now. Okay, so let's look at what uh, changes here. So we've got all the stuff in small text we've already talked about. That's where we left off with layer three. So what comes in at layer four is there, you start to get a sense or an awareness of a level of pure existence that is the deepest silence, the deepest stillness that's within awareness, right? But it's just, it's a very vague sense. It's a mystery. Most people will never make it there. Um, if you do though, then you, you know, you start to actually directly experience it and then you start to become associated with it and then you deepen into it, right? So it's that same sort of process that unfolds. Again, differences across them. I don't think we're gonna have time to go back to these, but they will at least be there to pause. So this is another way to conceptualize it or think about it, where you have the locations and their properties, and then you have the properties like the main property or one of the main properties of each of the layers above it, right? And so, you know, you're basically at an intersection of experience here. If you're in location two, layer three, you're a mix of the experience, things that are under the location two column and the fullness and the other attributes that you heard that go along with layer three as an example. That's why this is a matrix, essentially. So the layers have affinities to locations. And here's, a, here's sort of the map of that, right? And so you can see that for location one, basically uh, layer one is a default for it. If you transition to location one, odds are it's gonna be the layer one. Uh, layer two, nonetheless, is pretty accessible. Layer three is very difficult to get to. Layer four is virtually impossible to get to. Uh, if you do get to it, it's, you know, going to be temporary experiences for the most part. Um, location two, you can land in either layer one or layer two in location two. So we can kind of consider both of them uh, as potential default locations. Layer three is highly accessible. Layer four is difficult to get to, but not impossible. Um, and again, it's going to mostly be a temporary experience unless you just really work at it. You just really rooted yourself in location two. You just spend a lot of time trying to get to and root into layer four. Uh, location three, layer one is highly accessible, layer two is highly accessible, but layer three is really the default. Layer three is sort of the home base for location uh, three, and layer four is accessible there. Location four, the default, and look from location four on basically, it's really layer four, and to some degree at location four, when you first transition, it's a little bit of a mix of layer four and uh, the upper part of layer three. And then usually after a couple of weeks to a few months, someone will go through a deepening experience that sort of solidifies their uh, experience of location four. And what that really is doing is just sort of shifting them up into, into layer four and locking that in more. Um, and so you can see that, you know, layer one can be accessible. You can sort of watch your mind doing its stuff uh, but it's generally avoided. It's just not something that people tend to do, care about, whatever else. Layer two is accessible. Layer three is still highly accessible in location four. But as you go to later and later locations, it becomes very difficult to get out of layer four. 
Um, so transitioning to fundamental well-being, again, you can transition to anything that's gray here. Um, you, can, you can transition straight into the default, you know, layer three or layer four of location four, um, or anywhere on down. There are, you know, commonalities. Most people are going to transition and mostly stay from our, for, for their fundamental well-being existence in the first four squares, basically, in layer one and two of location one and two. Uh, it's not that common for people to really bust out of those. Uh, so that is where the majority of finders, uh, people who experience fundamental well-being, uh, typically reside. Now, there are some common paths through this. And you'll see this, you'll pick this up. Now that you've heard these descriptions and stuff, you'll pick this up and from spiritual teachers and stuff. Uh, and so, you know, again, they don't know about location one, location two, location three, location four, for the most part, unless they've studied our work. Uh, and so they're describing the layers and they're describing a movement through the layers, right? So this is a very common pattern for people to come in at location one, layer one, and move up to layer two and then over to location two, staying at layer two and then climb up from there. Here's another common path, landing in location two. And often these people have had experiences in location one, but deny it. No, but some people do just land in location two. Often that is either at layer one or layer two. And then they sort of work their way up from there, depending upon their goals, belief system, whatever else. This is sort of the sweet spot path for those that go to further locations. Uh, so they can come in at anywhere, but let's say they come in at location one, layer one. It's basically they'll climb their way up to layer two, move over to location two, climb their way up to layer three, move over to location three, then jump to location four. Again, usually a mix initially between the layer top of layer three and layer four. Uh, and then they'll deepen into layer four in location four, and then they'll move to later locations from there. So another thing is that people rarely isolate in just a single layer. There are some commonalities. So it's very common for people in location one to have um, some persistence in both layer one and layer two, kind of like a smear, if you will, of the two. Now, a great thing about that is that now, if you understand these categories, you can do a lot with that, right? And so you can see, you can realize, oh, this is a smear. I can work on getting a more comprehensive experience of layer two because um, I know its properties now and I can get some distinction between layer two and layer one and I can get some fluidity and stuff. Um, we'll talk about fluidity in a minute. Uh, very often layer three and layer one is a, for location two as an example for somebody that's worked their way up to layer three. Um, and so if they work their way up to layer three, they're often not in layer three all the time but if, they're oper if they're functional in the world. So what's happening is basically they're sort of zooming in to, loca to, to location two layer one for effectiveness. And then when they don't have to be as effective in the world for a moment or for a week or for whatever, uh, they can kind of disengage that and go and they'll float back up to where they're more of their default is. And that default is gonna be more uh, layer three in this example, right? And they can basically just skip right over layer two. And layer two can just kind of be not something that's experienced in a situation like that, right? So you see some of the other affinities uh, as well. These are, these are the most common affinities uh, for people that have made it to layer three or layer four and location two, three, and four uh, as an example. And the same for location one. So the other thing that you wanna keep in mind is that it's possible to experience the integration of layers. Uh, you know, you're experiencing, you're not thinking about it, a smear probably of these layers if you're in fundamental well-being between layer one and layer two. Um, just let's say you're at location one, layer one and layer two, and you're experiencing both of them. You're, they're, you're showing up as a smear, right? That's kind of an integration in a way. So you can actually integrate across all of these layers. And that's especially true if you go far out. And so let's say that you're at location six, seven, eight, you know, something like that. From those locations, um, you can affect some pretty cool stuff and you've gotten a lot of distinctions. Um, in your own sort of conscious experience. And one of the things that becomes possible as you move to later locations is you can integrate uh, all of these layers. You can also do that at location two, location three. Uh, it becomes a little bit easier with some of the things that happen in your consciousness later on. Um, and so there's that's a good idea to do. 
incidentally, having this having this experience integrated is in a way optimal. Um, you also almost everyone will have glimpses of other layers and locations. So even if you're in location one, layer one, chances are that you're having glimpses of other places and that's usable. Um, and then there's the notion of fluidity versus fixity. Uh, and so this is the idea that it's basically a good idea to develop fluidity across the locations and across the layers. It basically, it's, it's sort of like having a highly flexible, highly capable nervous system, if you will, from the standpoint of fundamental well-being. And that is often in contrast uh, to, the, to the other way of looking at this, which is that you're just going to sort of root in somewhere, you know, that you're in a tradition and that tradition says location four, layer four is where it's at, right? Or location three, layer three is where it's at. And you're putting all of your effort into getting to that place and locking into that place. And you're really just trying to fix yourself in that spot as much as possible. You can totally do that. It's okay to do that. Um, you know, we don't have anything bad to say about that per se, except that it does seem like the more, from all of our research from all these years, it does seem like across thousands of people, right? Um, well over a decade, um, coming closer to two decades than I even want to think about. <laughs> Um, you know, you, it, the, the nervous system seems to want this flexibility that is fluidity and the richness of the experience that you have in fundamental well-being and in life is just massive uh, compared to, you know, fixing in a specific point um, with whatever its little narrow bit of perception is. Okay, that's it. I'm out of time. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you all for... Uh, your attention. And um, I'm going to put a link in the chat for this presentation. Um, I'm going to get the next speaker up and going first. And then I'm going to put a link into the chat. And you can use that link if you want to get on a mailing list. And then as soon as I have a spare moment, we're going to send um, things like examples of the different locations and layers like those grids that we didn't have time for. Um, we'll send it to the people that are on um, that list, basically. So that list is basically just exists uh, if you want that additional information. Okay, that's it.